Uh, technology. It just seems like in the last month or so, um, I feel like I've become technologically illiterate. I, I realized this morning when I thought I was unplugging and plugging my modem in to reset it, I was unplugging another extension cord. And uh, so I wasn't resetting my modem. Um, so hopefully these problems um, will solve themselves. Okay, uh, any questions about the inner work? Um, no? Nothing at the moment. Nothing at the moment. Okay, um, I mean, I'm going to continue with uh, the final part of uh, discussing the misuse of C12 or sexual energy. And uh, one of the members of my online group said, what's this number you're always talking about? And I'm going, number? And uh, C12 was the number that I'm always talking about. And um, let me just... Uh, bring this up to share. C12 is not, I tried to explain it to him, C12 is not a number, but it's actually a molecule that we produce naturally. Uh, food comes into our mouth at dose 768. Uh, then it moves, so it meets with the saliva in our mouth, which is uh, the plus sign of 192. It goes into our stomach meets the gastric juices in our stomach at uh, 96 and it comes to me and it, it comes to an end there unless it gets the shock from air and so air provides the extra shock and then it moves uh from the due, uh, from the stomach or from the duodenum it comes into the mouth meets the saliva so the mouth is dull stomach is raked the duodenum is me liver is fa the cerebral hemispheres, the right and left cerebral hemispheres are so. La is the cerebellum, and then C is uh, the testes or the ovaries, our reproductive organs. And so just kind of explaining that this is the, the, the natural progression. Over here, what a person naturally produces in the highest element we naturally produce is this molecule called C12. And so what I'm talking today about, and what I've been talking for the last few weeks about, is the misuse of that specific molecule. Um, so as I've talked about before, Angelica, how are you? Um, my mistake this morning, um, I sent the link to the wrong place um, without realizing it. Uh, so we got off a little late. It's just, as I've said before, as I've mentioned before, the proper use of C12 is for the sensation of self. It's for the development and the awareness of our physical body. Now, sometimes for a lot of people, especially if you're new to the work and you're new to conscious relaxation, it's important to learn how to consciously relax the body. Now I've got an elaborate uh, 22 minute exercise on the uh, Gurdjieff Group YouTube channel that goes through a fairly elaborate process of relaxing the body. And ultimately, we should be able to just, in a moment, relax our body, to let go of all tension. Uh, years ago, when I was trying to figure out why I was able to do inner work in ways that a lot of my peers were not, I realized later on, much, much later, that part of it was my ability to easily and effortlessly relax my body. Uh, later on, when I became a hypnotherapist, learning how to enter into a trance state very quickly also involves this deep physical relaxation. So if you're holding any tension in your body, this is sort of a form of physical identification. If you're, the muscles in your face are too tense or your neck and shoulders are too tense or your body is too tense, this inhibits the ability to properly do inner work. Now, relaxation should come from the head down. So, uh, but before we do that, I'm just going to um, bring up my... Uh, normal, uh, the vow of inner work. 
that we are not only working for ourselves, we are not only working for mankind, we are working for the earth herself. All of our new work works along these three dimensions. So, Mr. Gurdjieff's vow, I wish to be, I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be. I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be to help others. Now, as a hypnotherapist, I often get my clients breathing in to the crown of their head and then sending a wave of relaxation down their body as they breathe out. This is a very quick, very effective way to relax. As we breathe in, we actually tense certain muscles, and as we breathe out, we relax those muscles. So let's begin by just breathing in to the top of the head and then relaxing our whole body down to the bottom of our feet as we breathe out. Breathing in at your own pace to the top of your head, and then as you breathe out, relax your whole body down to the bottom of your feet. Breathing in to the top of your head, and then relaxing your whole body again at your own pace down to the bottom of your feet. And then become aware of the top of your head and do your best to relax the top of your head. Then relax your forehead, your eyebrows, relaxing your eyes, your nose and face, even relaxing the occipital muscle in the very back of the head, just allowing your body to relax deeper and deeper. And then moving down into the neck and throat, relaxing first on the inside, the muscles involved in swallowing, relaxing the muscles towards the front of the neck, and then relaxing the muscles from the towards the back of the neck. A lot of tension is held in the head, uh, the neck. The neck has to support our head. All of the main arteries that feed our head and everything go through the neck. And chronic tension in the neck and shoulders is a major place where people hold this tension in their bodies. So relax your throat, neck, and shoulders. Then relax your upper arms, lower arms, hands and fingers. Then relax your chest, your midriff, your abdomen, all the way down to your pelvis. And here, J.G. Bennett says that we should actually begin also to relax the inside of our mouth. So relaxing our tongue, relaxing the muscles involved in swallowing, relaxing the esophagus, relaxing the stomach, the duodenum, really striving to relax the intestines, and relaxing the area behind the navel. J.G. Bennett says we still have a plant self, so to speak, and the digestive process below the duodenum is involved in the digestion of that energy, and it's very important to bring that relaxation to our navel and behind our navel. And then move back up to the upper back and shoulder blades. Really relax the upper back and shoulder blades, the middle back, the lower back. Relax our buttocks and hips. Relaxing our upper legs and knees, our lower legs, our ankles. Relaxing our heels, our toes, the top and bottom of our feet our souls, our insteps. And I always like to encourage my clients to relax the bones in their feet, just to feel a soft flow of energy flowing out through the soles of the feet through a deeper sense of relaxation. And then perhaps bring your awareness back to your hands and relax your hands as deeply as you can, relaxing the bones in your hands, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, and try to become aware of that soft flow of energy that we can sense out through the palms of our hands. And then 
Again, breathe to the top of your head and then relax your whole body as you breathe out, sending a wave of relaxation down your body with each natural breath that you take. Breathing into the top of your head and relaxing your whole body as you breathe out, just allowing your body to enter into deeper and deeper states of relaxation. And Mr. Gurdjieff says that relaxation is endless. We can always relax deeper and deeper. And J.G. Bennett hints at this in his book, Transformations. To relax the skin of our body, to try to relax the whole epidermis, the whole skin of our body. And then to try to relax the muscular and flesh self in the body to try and relax all of the muscles, all of the tendons, all of the ligaments in our body, breathing into the top of our head and relaxing all of the muscles, all of the flesh in our body, and then breathing into the top of our head and trying our best to relax all of our bones, again breathing into the top of our head and this time trying to relax all of the nerves in our body, and then breathing into the top of our head, trying to relax all of our marrow, and we can go deeper and deeper. And Bennett said that Mr. Gurdjieff told him that there were seven levels of relaxation. He never explained what these were. He only focused on the first few. But just understand that we can relax deeper and deeper, breathing into the top of our head and relaxing our whole body down to the bottom of our feet as we breathe out. Now let's do Mr. Gurdjieff's filling exercise. As a vessel fills with warm golden honey, imagine filling your body slowly with sensation, starting with the bottom of your feet, sensing the bottom of your feet, and then slowly, like a vessel fills with warm golden honey, filling your feet with sensation. Filling with sensation up to your ankles, up through your lower legs, up to your knees, up through your upper legs, up to your hips, and then include your hands. And then filling with sensation up through your lower arms, uh, lower torso, your abdomen and lower back, to your midriff, uh, elbows, middle back. Filling with sensation up through your upper arms, your chest, your upper back. Filling with sensation all the way up to your shoulders. Up through your neck, up into your head, the lower part of your head. Up to level with your mouth, up to level with your nose, level with your eyes and ears. And filling with sensation in your whole body. Trying to sense your whole body as one organic whole. And try to maintain this sensation of self. Try to hold on to this sensation of self throughout this meeting. Recognizing that in this moment we are sensing our physical body as one organic whole. In this moment we are aware of our whole physical self. We are properly and lawfully using C12. So whenever we're not present to our body, whenever we're not aware of our body, we have the potential to be misusing C12. So when you walk down the street, walk down the street with an awareness of your body, how you land with your heel, push off with your ball and toes, Become aware of the movement of your toe joints, your ankle joints, your knee joints, your hip joints. As you walk down the street, become aware of how your the bottom and your top of your body move in a contralateral fashion in order to maintain balance. You may step forward with your right leg and move your left arm forward. Become aware of the movement of your shoulder joints when you're walking your arms. Uh, sense your body when you're sitting. Become aware of the effect of gravity on your body. Sense gravity pulling you down. Become aware of your sitting bones underneath you, pressing down against the chair. 
Become aware of your thighs underneath you, pressing down against the chair, perhaps sensing your feet on the ground. Wherever you are, bring your awareness back to your body. If you're in front of the computer, a mindfulness bell is a wonderful way to bring you back to the sensation of yourself. There's a website you just have to type in Mindful Bell uh, DC or Washington DC, uh, and it'll take you to, I think it's called mindfulness mindfulnessbell.org, and you can set a bell to ring on your computer. You can set it to ring randomly, or you could set it to ring at specific intervals to remind you to come back to your body, to come back to the sensation of self. Anytime we are aware of our entire body as one organic whole in this moment, we are properly using C12. We are using this energy for our own development. And as we maintain this awareness of our body, as we sense our body from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, as we sense our body from side to side, from front to back, as we sense our body as one organic whole, we are also leaving a higher order impression or a higher order crystallization within us. And the more we do this, the more we impress this somewhere within us, the more we create these higher order crystallizations. And through this process, we begin to grow what Mr. Gurdjieff called our Kesjian body. This is the most basic, the most important, and the most preliminary exercise. There are other more advanced exercises that we can do, and I've talked about these in previous meetings. But if you cannot develop the sensation of self, if you cannot develop that organic awareness of your body as one whole, the other exercises won't necessarily lead to the right results. This is the most basic, the most essential form of mindful awareness. We want to get so good at sensing our body, at becoming aware of our body, at sensing our whole body as one organic whole that we can. Put it into second position and hold it in the back of our awareness. But recognize that whenever we are present in our body, we are lawfully using C12. So practice doing this, sensing your body sitting, walking, riding a bike. We can do this anywhere we have the presence of mind to do so. Sensing your body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. Sensing your body breathing. Sensing the air that flows in through your nose, nasal passage, back of mouth, throat, down into your vocal cords and back out again. Sensing the various muscles involved in breathing, your diaphragm, abdomen, the muscles between your ribs. Sensing your whole body breathing. And these last three things that I've talked about, Becoming aware of the sensation of air, sensing the various muscles involved in breathing and sensing your whole body breathing are the first three steps that the Buddha talks about in the great discourse on mindfulness. The importance of bringing it into the body, sensing the body. Now let's finish with the collected state exercise. So as the earth has an atmosphere, so too do we have an atmosphere. Our atmosphere is normally dispersed. It's pulled this way and that way by our thoughts, by our emotions, by what we happen to be identified with or thinking about at the moment, by disturbances in our body. Bring this atmosphere back, collect it around you, about a meter, meter and a half, four to six feet. Pull it back towards you. Become aware of its boundary. Keep it still. Keep it tranquil. Keep it calm. And Mr. Gurdjieff says that we should always finish inner work, particularly things like the morning sitting with this collected state exercise. So become aware of your atmosphere. Draw it back towards you. Keep it calm. 
keep it still, keep it tranquil. And in a moment, I'm going to count from one to three. And when I get to three, breathe it in. And as you breathe out, imagine that some of the emanations remain within you and they begin to settle within you. One, two, three. Breathe your atmosphere in, and then as you breathe out, imagine some of the emanations remain within you. And then silently repeat, may results from this work, or may results from this exercise, be transubstantiated within me for my being. And then just slowly come back to the present moment. And as I said uh, in the last meeting, um, a good exercise, a mental exercise, is to think of the monastic path. And unfortunately in the West, when we think of enlightenment, when we think of awakening, we think of the monastic path. We think of the Eastern traditions. And what did they emphasize in those traditions? They emphasized celibacy. They emphasized the need to flee the world. The early Christian desert fathers, this was called Hugamundi, fleeing the world. Uh, in the Eastern traditions, it means renouncing your family, renouncing your name, going to a monastery, either on a mountaintop or hidden in a forest, and taking monastic vows, and leading a very, very settled life. There is no such thing as Monday or Tuesday in a monastery or weekends. Today should be like yesterday, and tomorrow should be like today, and a thousand years from now, today, should be like it was today and tomorrow again like today. They specifically eliminate all of those distractions, all of those ways that C12 can be misused. So this is a good thought experiment to think about what they do in the monastic tradition to prevent C12 from being misused. Because in the monastic tradition, they don't understand the nature of the first and second conscious shock. And so they have to necessarily work with the transformation of C12. And so if we look at the structure of the monastery, how a monastery has been set up, how it's hidden away from the world, how the monks shave their hair, hair is a sense of identity, it gives us a sense of distinctiveness. They wear saffron colored robes or the Christian monk robes, getting rid of any kind of separate identity that is related to clothing and whatnot. Now, I've talked about this before and I actually have a water squirter in front. I'm sure the dog and cat are going to run away. But the misuse of C12 is like spraying onto illusions. It's taking this energy, and it's not just an energy. C12 is a physical substance. It's a molecule that we produce within us. It's like spraying this on something that's illusionary, spraying it on sandcastles in the sky, when we really should be turning it around and spraying it on ourselves and using it to coalesce, to land on ourself. And so J.G. Bennett calls the energy of hydrogen 24, the energy of mindful awareness, the energy that uh, Mr. Gurdjieff used the term personal consciousness. J.G. Bennett called it sensitive energy. I never liked that term. I thought there's too many uh, possibilities of misunderstanding it. I much prefer the energy of identity. And we can either use C12 as the energy of physical identity to become aware of our body, or we can lose it and spray it on all 
sorts of things in the world. The misuse of C12 is the biggest problem for humanity. It's there in every act of identification. And I'm not going to talk about identification today. I was thinking about it this week. I realized that identification is such a huge topic that uh, I'll probably, I should devote uh, the next meeting to understanding this process of identification. But the entire fashion industry, for instance, is based on the misuse of C12. So if you can think of what the fashion industry entails, if you can think of makeup, clothing, the latest colors, all of that, that's the misuse of C12. It's also the basis of the whole entertainment industry. Uh, if you look at uh, you know music videos, if you listen to the top music, uh, you know the, the number of best-selling music uh, around, it's all based and fueled by the misuse of C12. So again, going back to that thought experiment of being in a monastery, they're not exposed to the latest cultures. They're not exposed to the latest fashion. Um, they don't wear fashionable clothes and jewelry and paint their faces and do all sorts of things. I've also noticed this, that you know, here in Toronto, there's supposed to be this conscious community. And there are, are events where you, know, you look at the events, you see the pictures, and it just reeks of the misuse of C12. People are going to these events to see, to look, and be seen. They're wearing very skimpy clothing. They're very much into muscle shirts and all sorts of things. Focusing on something that's illusionary, focusing on those sandcastles in the sky, so to speak, when that energy should be directed inwards, not outwards, not on appearance, not on form. It should be focused on ourselves, on the sensation of our physical body, on the awareness of our body as one organic whole. Whenever we are aware of our body, in this moment, we are lawfully using this energy. But when we get caught up in fashion and music and drama and TV and all of those things, we are actually misusing this energy. And back in 1915, when uh, uh, Mr. Gurdjieff was teaching this to Uspensky, he talked about how people go to church to be seen to intermingle with the opposite sex. People go to the ballet, they go to theater. All of these things that uh, they thought back then were high culture, were the epitome of the civilization, like the ballet and church and the theater, were really just places where people would get together to flirt, to be around the opposite sex, to wear their best clothes, to make themselves into peacocks, or to paint their faces, to misuse this energy. And again, going back to the monastic tradition, you know, when you think of what monks are supposed to shun, what they are supposed to keep away from, they're supposed to keep away from events like that. They're supposed to Focus inwards, focus on the sensation of self, um, focus on their breathing, focus on their body, not be allowed, not allow themselves to use this energy in 10,000 different ways. Um, now I'm going to uh, go back just a second. Um, so, again, crystallizations. And Mr. Gurdjieff used the idea of impressions. Back when he was talking to Uspensky, phonographs were around. They used these big wax cylinders on which they were able to impress sounds uh, so they could play it back. But he also entails used the word crystallizations. And so every thought that we think Every feeling that we feel, every sensation that we experience, everything that we see, hear, smell, taste, every 
word that we think in our brain, every image we bring to our brain leaves a tiny impression, a tiny crystallization within us. And over time, these crystallizations grow. And we can crystallize the right way or we can crystallize the wrong way. And people who are misusing C12, normal people, they have what Mr. Gurdjieff calls a deformed essence. Their essence is not built on a proper foundation. Fortunately, one way this can be decrystallized, this improper essence is just not to feed it anymore. Another way to decrystallize it is through remorse of conscience. In other words, bringing remorse of conscience to past memories and repairing our past. And I've talked about remorse of conscience, I think, a couple of months ago, the importance of it to help us decrystallize. Another technique uh, that we can use, and uh, this is entails, is hypnosis. Mr. Gurdjieff said that one of the powers of hypnosis is the ability to decrystallize impressions previously impressed within us so that we can go back through hypnosis and repair our past. And probably the easiest way to decrystallize these abnormal impressions that have crystallized within us through the misuse of C12. So this is at the level of essence. This is what causes deformed essences is just by not feeding it anymore. Um, eventually, they just melt and decrystallize over time on their own, which is also one of the techniques in the monastic tradition. Rather than doing psychotherapy, rather than going and trying to decrystallize these things within them, they just stare at a wall and meditate and pray and walk mindfully and develop that awareness. And slowly, all of those other things, those abnormal crystallizations, just naturally begin to dissolve within a person if they are not fed and not continually maintained. Mr. Gurdjieff said only those crystallizations, only those memories, only those experiences that we experience in the state of self-remembering forever become a part of our being. The others, if they're not fed, if they're not continually brought to the surface and maintained, will eventually dissolve and decrystallize on their own. But there, as I said, are ways of accelerating this process, um, remorse of conscience, and uh, uh, various other techniques. So this crystallization, whenever we misuse C12, whenever we think, Whenever we think in words, whenever we think in pictures, whenever we look, listen, smell, taste, even if we're not fully aware of doing that, whenever we're aware, bring our attention to certain things, this creates an impression within us. And this impression can block our further growth. And so we need to build proper foundations. You know, we cannot build a house on sand or else you know, the winds will come, the water will come, and it will blow away. We need to have a firm foundation. And the firm foundation in this work and in this process is the sensation of self, the awareness of our physical body as one organic whole from the bottom of our feet all the way to the top of our head. To be aware of our body, as Mr. Gurdjieff has termed, the sensation of self. We do this over and over and over. And we crystallize these higher order impressions in the proper form and sequence. We use this as the foundation, as the basis upon which we build the Kesjian body, the basis upon which we build this higher self within us. And it all starts with lawfully and properly using C12 to crystallize this foundation, this awareness of our physical body. Now, <clears throat> continuing with the, the quotes, um, this comes from In Search of the Miraculous, and it's, with what hydrogen does the sex center work? 
asked another. This question had interested us for a long time, but we had not previously been able to answer it. And G, when he had been asked before, he never gave a direct reply. And here I want to make it clear, we're talking about a hydrogen, we're talking about an actual physical molecule. You know, this molecule is beyond perhaps the ability of science to detect it at the moment. Maybe we're beginning to detect some of these higher molecules, but this is an actual physical substance. When we use the term energy, energy is an abstract term. Energy is an abstract term invented by the human brain in order to explain certain things that we can see. But energy itself is meaningless. Jet fuel is energy. Kerosene is energy. Coal is energy. Wood is energy. These are all physical substances. So we're talking about an actual molecule that exists within us, an actual physical substance produced for hydrogen 12, produced by our testes or our ovaries, a physical substance produced in the human body. So we're not speaking about something metaphysical, something abstract. We are think, talking about something real. So just try to bring yourself back to your body now. Try to sense your whole body as one organic whole, aware of your whole body. The sex center works with hydrogen 12, he said on this occasion. That is to say, it ought to work with it. This is C12. Do 76, Do Re Mi Fa Sol La, coming up to C12. But the fact is that it very rarely works with its proper hydrogen. Abnormalities in the working of the sex center require special study. So not only can we misuse C12, you know, when the intellectual misuses C12, you know, it writes books and it wants to be number one in various different things. Uh, when the emotional center misuses C12, it can lead to daydreaming, imagination. But when this energy is plundered for these other centers, then the actual sexual center itself has to draw on a lower energy. So there are many different ways we can misuse C12, and there are many different results. When C12 is stolen by the other centers, the sexual center, the sex center, doesn't get to operate as it properly should. So again, as I scroll up, just bring your awareness back to your body, sensing your whole body as one organic whole, from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. In the first place, it must be noted that normally in the sex center, as well as in the higher emotional and the higher thinking centers, there is no negative side. And elaborating on this, J.G. Bennett said that binaries and dualities enter at the level of hydrogen 24. Hydrogen 12 has no opposite. So any phenomenon that's hydrogen 12, it doesn't break into the binaries. The binaries are the step below. So the below uh, in world 24, we can have uh, love and anger. We can have joy and despair. We can have fear and peace. They are broken. They're divided into the polarities. But at the level of 12, there is no division. Another way uh, J.G. Bennett explained this, at the very lowest level, in world 48, we have three brains. In world 24, we have three centers. And then using Mr. Gurdjieff's term in tales, in world 12, we have three spiritualized parts. And the spiritualized parts indicate that there's a fundamental unity at that level. That's the level where positive, negative, and reconciling 
meet together as one. They're not broken and then created into binaries as happens below that. So at that world, world 12, the world of the real eye, the world of the awakened realm, there are no binaries, no opposites. It's a trinary or a trinitarian realization at that level. So going back in the first place, it must be noted that normally in the sex center, as well as in the higher emotional and the higher thinking, and let me just come back over here, um, because he's given different numbers for these, but he is talking about this realm here, you know, on level with our sun. Anything that happens at the solar realm, at the awakened level, so the level awake man, um, the level with the angels, anything that happens at this realm has no opposites. It's a trinitarian or trinary or tertiary or whatever term we want to use, awareness. But it's a, there's an indivisible whole um, at that level. At that level, it moves to a oneness. So when he's talking about the energy of the emotional center, he is talking here with so 12 and the intellectual center in here with me 12. So he gives other definitions. Um, he says, you know, elsewhere he says the higher intellectual center works with Ba 6. Um, Oops, let me just uh, try and get rid of these. So, you know, it can be a little confusing when he uses different terms. Basic, you know, he talks about the higher intellectual center, and then he talks about the emotional center, working with hydrogen 24. Um, so these centers, the emotional center goes all the way up, the intellectual center all the way up, the physical center all the way up. So in this particular quote, he is talking about at that particular level. So the higher emotional and higher thinking centers at the level of hydrogen 12, there is no negative side. In all other centers except the higher ones, in the thinking, in the emotional, in the moving, in the instinctive, in all of them, there are, so to speak, two halves, the positive and the negative, affirmation and negation, yes and no. In the thinking center, pleasant and unpleasant sensations. In the thinking center, pleasant, yeah, yes or no in the thinking center. Pleasant and unpleasant sensations in the moving and the instinctive center. There is no such division in the sex center. And here I want to point out another problem. If you take Uspensky as gospel truth, um, Uspensky said that their negative emotions are absolutely useless. In a sense, most negative emotions are, and we should be striving to understand our negative emotions. But the emotional center from world 24 or the emotional brain in world 48 are broken into those binaries. And so when the emotional center uh, shouldn't have a negative, that's a very high level of emotional awareness. That is after many, 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 many years of working on oneself. And it has led to a lot of problems. Oh, you're being negative. I've heard of people who have abused these teachings. There is a specific cult that uh, has abused the Gurdjieff teachings, and it's one way to keep people in line. There's also a very interesting book called the uh, Calmsworth Chronicles that was written by a member of a Gurdjieff Foundation group where the leader and the group was not uh, based you know, properly on a proper understanding of these teachings. And they went around everything that displeased the leader about other people. He said, that's your ego. And this is a cult tactic. You know, whenever anyone starts to say you're being egotistical or you're being egocentric as a Gurdjieffian, you should look at them and smile and say, yes, Mr. Gurdjieff said, in order 
to become egoless, first I have to be an egotist. In other words, first I have to be settled and strong within myself. And the calling, using the word ego, trying to break people, oh, that's just your ego speaking, is a technique of cults. And if you get involved in an organization and they start criticizing you and saying it's your ego, you should walk away. First, become an egotist. One of the aphorisms on the study house wall by Mr. Gurdjieff. First, become that egotist. And once you've done that, you can begin to release the ego. But if you release the ego too soon, you won't have a proper foundation. The ego is a protective mechanism. He told um, C.S. Not, the ego has the twin sentinels. And a sentinel is a guardian. It protects us. The twin sentinels of Monsieur self-love and Madame vanity. Our ego is there to protect us. And at a certain point, it strangles us. But at the beginning of the work, and for a normal person, it's absolutely needed. So getting back to uh, the quote here. Um, for the sex center, so operating with hydrogen 12, operating at that level, there is no such division in the sex center. There are no positive and negative sides in it. There are no unpleasant sensations or unpleasant feelings in it. There is either a pleasant sensation, a pleasant feeling, or there is nothing, an absence of any sensation, complete indifference. And again, as I scroll up, become aware of your body. Sense your body as one organic whole. Develop the sensation of self. But in consequence of the wrong work of centers, it often happens that the sex center unites with the negative part of the emotional center or with the negative part of the instinctive center. And then stimulation of a certain kind of sex center or even any stimulation at all of the sex center calls forth unpleasant feelings and unpleasant sensations. People who experience unpleasant feelings and sensations which have been evoked in them through ideas and imagination connected with sex are inclined to regard them as a great virtue or as something original. In actual fact, it is simply disease. Everything connected with sex should either be should be either pleasant or indifferent. Unpleasant feelings and sensations all come from the emotional center or the instinctive center. And you know, here one of the abnormalities of our society, particularly when we go back a little bit, was the shame and the sin that was associated with sex. You know, sex is sinful. Sex, you know, the whole church shaming people, really being negative about sexuality, is there they are connecting it with the negative part of the emotional center. And so people walk around thinking they are dirty for having sex. Uh, it, it has had many problems over the ages in the context of marriages, where people were raised to believe until marriage that sex was sinful, it was dirty, connecting with that idea, with that feeling in their emotional center. And even when they get married, uh, this goes along with it and this is a lowering of this energy it's a linking of the sexual energy and the sexual function with these negative emotions and then the instinctive center the physical body um i remember a few years ago when uh, the book 50 shades of gray came out and it became a bestseller i just thought no um, you know, this is the equating of sexuality with physical pain, with punishment, with uh, um, sadism and masochism, uh, you know, SM, BD, whatever it's, you know, um, the whole 
linking of sex with pain, uh, the connection. And Mr. Gurdjieff said for people who do that, for people who connect their sexuality with pain, either they want to inflict pain or they want to experience pain along with their sexuality, he said they become so abnormal that they cannot work on themselves. The mystical path is closed to them. So this is a big problem in our society. When a book like Fifty Shades of Grey became a, an international bestseller, turned into a major motion picture, um, the glorification of sexuality and pain, uh, preventing any kind of further growth, preventing any kind of higher realizations, and preventing the proper lawful use of this energy. Now, I forget where I read this, but someone uh, who was a student of these teachings said, think potentially of your first sexual experience, how everything seemed so heightened, how everything seemed so vibrant, so alive. Um, he was implying that potentially our first sexual experience, we may have properly and lawfully used this energy. And that awareness of our body, the, the heightened sensations, the heightened mystery of it. And then over time, you know, repeated sexual acts, something sort of gets crystallized and darkened, and we lose that awareness. But coming back to our body, to sense every cell in our body, to bring this higher energy into our physical self, to lawfully use this energy to sense our entire body as one organic whole, to become aware of the magic and mystery involved in the sensation of self. One of his students asked Mr. Gurdjieff towards the end of his life, what was one of the most remarkable things that he has discovered? And he said that sensation keeps on deepening, that it's like there's deeper and deeper and deeper layers and levels to sensation. And he was towards the end of his life. He was fully aware of sensation, but the more he did it, the more his awareness of it deepened. And I find this to be true myself. Um, the more I sense my body, the more something in my body opens up, so to speak, the more, the deeper my sensation or my awareness of this realm of my being goes. And so when you sense your body as one organic whole, when you realize the importance of this exercise of this particular form of inner work and you continue doing it as often as you can bringing yourself back to your body back to the sensation of self over time you will notice that this sensation deepens but for those who have gotten broken um, so that they have an abnormal sexual center linked with the instinctive center, usually this is done in connection with equating the sexual, sexual act with pain or inflicting pain or the uh, sexual center getting linked with the emotional center and looking at the sinfulness of sex and you know all of the negative things that we think of uh, Western preachers 150 years ago, what they were preaching from the pulpit about sex that was linking sex with the emotional center and the negative side of the emotional center hell and damnation and all of that um so to understand this dimension of the misuse of sexual energy now sexual energy c12 is also misused by the intellectual center and it's also misused by the emotional center they don't have those higher carbons within the body. We don't, most people don't have those higher carbons within the body for the higher to blend with the lower to meet in the middle so that they don't have the necessary energy to continue the development of the octave of air through our emotions 
or to begin the development of the octave of impressions through our thoughts, through our awareness. And so they sort of hack in and steal that energy. And there's a particular smell or scent to that. And uh, so just come back to your body, come back to your physical self, come back to that organic awareness of your body as one indivisible whole. Sensing your body, sensing your breath, sensing the movement of your lungs, the movement of the various muscles involved in your breathing, sensing your whole body breathing, coming back to the sensation of self. So what you talked about, the linking of sex with the emotional center, those fire and brimstone creatures, um, and linking sex with the instinctive center, um, uh, introducing pain and connecting pain to sexuality. That is the abuse of sex. That is when the sexual center, uh, because that energy has been depleted in other ways, necessarily connects with those lower centers and creates extremely abnormal crystallizations within us. So this is the abuse of sex. It is necessary further to remember that the sex center, which to remember that the sex center works with hydrogen 12. This means it is stronger and quicker than all other centers. That is all other centers in normal man, in the person who hasn't begun to develop the other octaves. Sex, in fact, in fact, governs all other centers. Sensing your body again as I scroll up. The only thing in ordinary circumstances, that is, when man has neither consciousness nor will that holds the sex center in submission is buffers. Buffers can entirely be brought to naught. That is, they can stop its normal manifestation, but they cannot destroy its energy. Elsewhere, Mr. Gurdjieff says that the buffers within ourselves are created from C12. And to get rid of these buffers involves a process of liberation. But Within a normal person, a buffer fulfills an extremely important function. It prevents us from seeing our inconsistencies. It prevents us from seeing how we smile one moment and then flip into hatred the next. We're not aware of this change of state because buffers protect us. Um, buffer was the term uh, back in the 50s. Uh, 1915, when Mr. Gurdjieff was teaching, uh, people would travel long distance by railway cars. And the plastic, or not the plastic, but the rubber things between the railway cars that prevented them from smashing into each other, prevented them from shocking each other, were buffers. You know, we can think of them as shock absorbers. A buffer is a, like a shock absorber in a car. Shock absorber is probably a better term uh, using conventional analogies and our conventional understanding. It absorbs shocks. It's like blinders for a horse that you can't get distracted. Um, you may have seen someone go from a very loving and caring person in one moment to frothing with anger at the next and then back to proclaiming that they are such a loving person filled with light to hating their neighbor or you know filling with vitriol for something and what prevents us from seeing these inconsistencies are our buffers and our buffers are really almost like abnormal crystallizations of c12 holding this energy in a certain way and when we begin to work on ourselves, when we begin to see our contradictions, we begin to melt our buffers down. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff said that if a person had all their buffers removed in an instant, they would go crazy because they would see how inconsistent they are. They would see all of their contradictions, all of these 
different competing eyes and they would realize that they lacked unity they lacked this wholeness this oneness and so buffers are necessary for a normal person they're necessary for a person to able to to be able to survive in the world if their buffers were removed they would end up in an insane asylum so the work that i'm talking about and doing all of this is really the work of the mystical path getting back to the ego and uh mr gurdjieff telling cs not that the ego is created and partly created with the twin sentinels the protection of monsieur self-love and madame vanity and mr gurdjieff told cs not never try to get rid of an ego in a normal person that person needs their ego it's a defensive mechanism that protects them from stray influences in the outside world the ego only becomes problematic once we step on the mystical path once we begin to work on ourselves because it is important to see our own nothingness our own sense of helplessness but the ego for a normal person is very important and even as we step onto the mystical path it becomes even more important um, as a hypnotherapist i work with a lot of clients who have been taught to sublimate their ego and they're open to all sorts of nasty influences and manipulation and whatever and sometimes it's important to begin by strengthening our ego mr gurdjieff's first you must become an egotist before you can become egoless in other words first we have to make sure we have a firm boundary a firm sense of self and then we can get rid of it a lot of people do not have this firm boundary they have an uh, inability to say no they're pulled this way and that way by people and they have to stop that they have to stop being open to the world and being open to abuse and the way we begin to do that is to strengthen our ego but ultimately we have to become aware of our own insignificance and then we have to consciously and deliberately work against our ego but only when there's a certain degree of strength within us only when certain things have already coalesced within us getting back to this um, so buffers can entirely bring it to naught it can find up the sexual energy but they cannot destroy its energy the energy remains and passes over to other centers finding expression for itself through them in other words the other centers rob the sex center of the energy which it does not use itself the energy of the sex center in the working of the thinking emotional and moving centers can be recognized by a particular taste by a particular fervor by a vehemence which the nature of the affair concerned does not call for the thinking center writes books but in making use of the energy of the sex center it does not simply occupy itself with philosophy science or politics it is always fighting something disputing criticizing creating new subjective theories when i was a teenager i thought academics must be at the apex of human evolution and then when i went to university um and my ex-wife uh you know i was with her when she did her master's her phd her po postdoc when she became uh, uh her first academic position and i got to know other academics and it's like a den of thieves and backstabbing and ego and uh i know one academic who started his career by going after a giant in his field and he didn't initially start out knowing what was wrong with the giant in the field, but he realized that to make his name, if he brought that giant down, his name would be made. And this is a classic misuse of the 
sexual energy by thinking and the thinking center. Uh, academic conferences can be a hotbed of intrigue and ego. And I got to see sort of the other side of it by being an academic spouse and being invited to the parties that only the professors and whatever in the department can go to and realizing that a lot of those people, particularly the stars in their particular academic fields are egocentric, whiny, small children at heart. They are doing what they're doing to get grants, to get fame, to get publications. They are not pursuing knowledge for the pursuit of knowledge. They are not disinterested spectators in their own fields. Um, things like the Nobel Prize um, has distorted a lot of academics because there's one eye on trying to make that breakthrough that will lead to the Nobel Prize, that will lead to the awards, that will lead to the recognition. Even in the modern world, you know, going back five, 600 years, you know, the idea of naming things after people, um, you know, uh, Newtonian physics, uh, things like that. You know, there's a strong element of ego in the desire to find something in science and get it named after you so you have this immortality, so to speak, rather than objectively naming something. They do this with, uh, you know, when they discover fossils or uh, um, uh, new life forms, they often give it their name or the name of someone. Um, this is, again, the misuse of C12 at the academic level. Um, it's desire to be someone, the desire to be seen as being this real top-notch intellectual. The emotional center preaches Christianity, abstinence, asceticism, or the fear and horror of sin, hell, the torment of sinners, eternal fire, all this with the energy of the sex center. So those fire and brimstone preachers and, uh, you know, the, the mullahs and the, you know, real fundamentalist preachers are all, what they're doing is they're, they're, their sermons are made and fueled by this misuse. Or on the other hand, it works up revolutions, robs, burns, kills, again with the same energy. The moving center occupies itself with sports, creates various records, climbs mountains, jumps, fences, wrestles, fights, and so on. Uh, somewhere in these teachings, I remember Mr. Gurdjieff lamenting about the return of the Olympic Games as being a misuse of the sexual center, the desire to be number one, the desire to win gold, the desire to beat the other opponents. In all these instances, that is, in the work of the thinking center, as well as in the work of the emotional and the moving centers, when they work with the energy of the sex center, there is always one general characteristic, and this is a certain particular vehemence, and together with it, the uselessness of the work in question. Neither the thinking nor the emotional nor the moving centers can ever create anything useful with the energy of the sex center. This is an example of the abuse of sex, but it's only one aspect. Another aspect consists in the fact that when the energy of the sex center is plundered by the other centers and spent on useless work, it has nothing left for itself and has to steal the energy of other centers, which is much lower and coarser than its own. And yet the sex center is very important for the general activity and particularly for the inner growth of the organism because working with hydrogen 12, it can receive a very fine food of impressions such as none of the ordinary centers can receive. The fine food of impressions is very important for the manufacture of higher hydrogens. But when the sex center works with energy that is not its own, that is with comparatively low hydrogens, 48 and 24, its impressions become much coarser 
and it ceases to play a role in the organism which it could play. At the same time, union with and the use of energy by the thinking center creates far too great imagination on the subject of sex, and in addition, a tendency to be satisfied with this imagination. Union with the emotional center creates sentimentality, or on the contrary, jealousy and cruelty. This again, this is again the picture of the abuse of sex. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff said that one way we can determine the abuse of sex is if there's a particular, and he used the word, or it was translated into English by Uspensky, the term vehement. For myself, I've noticed we can actually use another word. If you can taste your ego in what you're doing, you know, if you're running because you want to be number one, underneath that's your ego. If you're writing a paper because you want to put someone else down or you want to be recognized in your field, that's your ego. If you climb a mountain because you want to climb the mountain, you want to conquer it, conquering, that's your ego. Uh, so negative emotions, anger, you know, how can they do that to me? There's an objective form of anger, but most of our anger is subjective. How can they do that to me? And in most negative emotions, it is the misuse of the sexual energy. So by uh, uh, this is the problem. This is the thing that is holding humanity down. The rubbing of the sexual center of its energy for the emotional center and the intellectual center that vehemence, that egotism uh, underlying all of those activities and forcing the sexual center to link with lower energies of the emotional and of the instinctive center. Um, all of the leakages within us can be traced back to this problem. So, you know, like he said, the, the, the sexual center um, or the person that I uh, talked about earlier, I forget where the quote came from, try to remember your first sexual experience. If it was a magical, magical experience, for some people it wasn't. But if it was a magical experience, you know, with a naivety and an innocence and all of that and a heightened awareness and a heightened sensitivity within the body, a heightened focus, you were feeding off higher impressions through the use of that energy. And so bringing the energy into proper alignment, using it to sense our body, and then going out into the world uh, without the ego, without that sense of vehemence, um, can allow us to begin to use it properly. And I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, I've thought about this for years. Uh, these last three meetings are the first time I've tried to systematically put this together. Um, so it sort of jumped around a bit, but uh, um, we've got a couple of minutes. Any questions, any comments, or just bring ourselves back to this? And I've got everyone muted. Let me unmute you all. Um, any comments, any questions? We've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, in just a couple of minutes, would you be able to uh, kind of just um, clarify what the instinctive center is? Well, it's the physical body. Um, the actual, the, 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 we have a moving center, the part that learns to ride bicycles, that learns to walk. And then we have the instinctive center, which is responsible for all other things. Um, hitting the hand, that's the instinctive center. It's not the moving center. So, you know, sadomasochism, connecting sex, say, with physical pain. The physical pain is something that's observed in the instinctive center. Uh, the moving center learns how to walk, it rides bicycles. A big part of talking, the movement of the mouth, the vocal cords is the moving center. So when he talks about the instinctive center, he's actually talking about the equation of sexuality, particularly with pain. Um, so at the instinctive center, we either don't feel pain or we feel pain, or, or we sense pain, the sensation, the instinctive sensation of pain. Um, so 
that's what he means in, in that context. Any other questions, comments? I mean, we're almost out of time. Um, again, technology. I don't know what it is with me and technology. Um, posting the link to the wrong place. And uh, so we're having a bit shorter of a program by, uh, I think, about 10, 15, 12 minutes. Uh, those of you who are watching on Facebook, hopefully you're still watching on Facebook. Let's just, again, then, bring our awareness back to our body. Make sure your body's relaxed. Notice where there's any tension in your body. Breathe into the top of your head. Relax your body down to the bottom of your feet as you breathe out. This is a good exercise, breathing into the top of your head and learning to relax your body in a single breath. Uh, this prevents a lot of that physical body instinctive tension and everything from holding us back and using this energy. To do proper inner work, we have to be in the state of physical relaxation. So make sure your body's relaxed, breathing into the top of your head and relaxing your body down to the bottom of your feet as you breathe out. And then try to become aware of your body as one organic whole. Try to become aware of what Mr. Gurdjieff termed the sensation of self. Try to sense your whole body at once. And if you're having difficulty doing this, this is, it just means it's an area that you need to focus on. You need to train to develop this awareness. Um, some people have described it like a muscle, you know, getting the muscle in shape, but it's not. It's more than that. You're actually crystallizing something within you. And at a certain point, this inner crystallization, this inner crystallization that may, may be uh, the result of 10,000 or even 100,000 moments of sensing your body, this begins to then coalesce and take on a power of its own, and it becomes easier and easier to do. So if you have trouble doing it, if your attention is easily pulled this way and that, bring it back to your body. At the beginning of the mystical path, at the beginning of this process, this is where the real work begins, bringing it back to our body and then figuring out why we are misusing this energy, how we are misusing this energy, and maybe pulling this thread back and then that, that thread back and that thread back and plugging leaks slowly one at a time until we properly and lawfully use this energy for the sensation of self. And then we can begin to move on to higher exercises and a, a, a deeper form of inner work. So for those of you who are watching on Facebook, hopefully it's still broadcasting on Facebook, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, and for those of you, um, Brian, Angelica, Karen, Ian, thank you for being here. Um, think about questions for next week. We can start with some questions. Uh, those of you on Facebook, uh, if you can think of some questions, um, just add them into the comments uh, below uh, the video that will be shortly there soon, as soon as I stop uh, recording this. Uh, think about questions that you would like to ask me, and maybe next week I can begin by answering some of those questions, and then I can move into the whole field of identification, which is a massive understanding um, again, that's something I haven't explained to other people. I know very well within myself when I'm in a state of identification. And uh, so I'll try to begin with that one next week. At any rate, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining me. Um, take care. Bring your awareness back to your body. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.